Okay, so I'm John Rouser, and I'm a data scientist at Pinterest. Uh, and the title of this talk uh, is inspired by this paper. Uh, this paper has perhaps the best opening paragraph of any academic work I've ever read, uh, which I will now adapt for my purposes. When I decided to learn statistics, I read several books, which I shall politely not identify. I understood none of them. Most of them simply described statistical procedures and then applied them without any intuitive explanation or hint of how anyone might have invented these procedures in the first place. And this talk was born of that frustration and my wish that future students of statistics will learn the deep and elegant ideas at the heart of statistics rather than a confusing grab bag of statistical procedures. I wrote this talk because I suspect that many of the people in this audience are faking it when it comes to statistics. <laughs> so there are two kinds of people, two kinds of technical people in this audience, uh, the software engineers and the statisticians. At Strata and in general, the engineers are by far the larger group. Actually in this room, uh, maybe this picture looks more like this. Right? Uh, there are probably few statisticians in this room that would not also self-identify as data scientists. And I think that many of the engineers look with some envy on the people that know statistics. Um, when someone with a little bit of stats knowledge starts going on about power analysis or generalized linear models or two-tailed tests or whatever it is, you know, you nod your head and you play along, but you really have no idea what they're talking about. Um, and I know this feeling. I am a software engineer who is self-taught in statistics over a period of about a decade. Uh, and I remember struggling with what seemed like the most basic questions. But it doesn't have to be this way. My thesis is that if you can program a computer, you have direct access to the deepest and most fundamental ideas in statistics. To convince you of this idea, I want to walk you through a statistical argument. Uh, and in order to do that, we need a problem to work on. So we're going to use statistics to figure out whether drinking beer makes you more attractive to mosquitoes. So th this is not a trivial problem, though it might seem one. Um, malaria, after all, is transmitted via mosquitoes. And most models for malaria transmission have historically assumed that all individuals are at equal risk for, uh, for mosquito bites. But there's good evidence that humans vary widely in their attractiveness to mosquitoes. Uh, and so if you can understand which people are at greatest risk for mosquito bites, then you can target your interventions much more accurately and you can do a better job of fighting malaria. This is such an important problem that if you do good research on it, you can get published in PLOS One, an extremely reputable journal. Uh, here I've redacted the keyword in the title uh, so as to leave the outcome in doubt for a moment. Uh, I don't have time to describe their method in the detail that it deserves, but they, they basically got a series of volunteers and then randomly assigned them to drink either beer or water. Uh, and then they used this device called a Y olfactometer to let mosquitoes choose to fly either toward the human subject or towards open air. And then they trapped and counted the mosquitoes. Here's the data. They had 25 volunteers who drank beer and 18 who drank water. And the, these numbers are the numbers of mosquitoes that were collected in the traps for each of the volunteers. Uh, we can compute the average number of mosquitoes in each group and then subtract to find that the average person who drank beer attracted 4.4 more mosquitoes than the average water drinker. Uh, and now we have a statistical question, right? Is a difference of 4.4 sufficient evidence to claim that drinking beer makes you more attractive to mosquitoes? We can frame this question as a debate between a skeptic and an advocate. The skeptic says that, yeah, probably it's the case that drinking beer has no effect. Uh, and that difference of 4.4, that could have just happened by random chance. The advocate takes the other side. The advocate says 4.4 is a large difference, uh, especially when you compare it to the overall variation in the sample. And so, so the skeptic's position is very unlikely to be true. Um, one of the main goals of statistics is to settle just this kind of debate. So what I want to do is walk you through it twice. Uh, first, I'll solve the problem using the painful analytical approach that you might remember from your Statistics 101 class. Uh, and then I'll do it again using a simple computational method uh, that should hopefully be much more understandable. Uh, okay, so bring on the pain. Um, 
If you took a stats class or you tried to read a stats book, uh, you might dimly recall something called a t-test that can be used to solve exactly this kind of problem. So you head off to Wikipedia and you remember that the first thing you need to do is you need to pick a test statistic. Uh, There are a whole bunch of possible choices, but after reading for a few minutes, you settle on this one, which is Welch's t-test. You plug in your numbers and you get a value of 3.67 for your data. You don't really know what this t-thing is, but Wikipedia tells you that if the skeptic is right, then, uh, then T is distributed according to this formula. That funny L-looking thing, that's the gamma function. That V-looking thing is the number of degrees of freedom. You read on Wikipedia about degrees of freedom for a little while, and you learn that degrees of freedom is the number of dimensions of the domain of a random vector. You have no idea what that means. <laughs> uh, But the page about the t-test on Wikipedia says that you can estimate your degrees of freedom with this formula. (laughs) And so you dutifully plug in your numbers and you get that you have 39.1 degrees of freedom. How you figure out the next step, I have no idea, but you manage to figure out that what you need to do is take that 39 uh, and use it to look up the critical value for the t-test in a table. So you do that and you get that the critical value at the 95% level for 40 degrees of freedom is 2.021. And that t-statistic that you computed five slides ago, uh, that thing, 3.67, is larger than the critical value, 2.021. And so sweet, you say to yourself, you can now confidently reject the skeptic's argument argument and say that a difference of 4.4 additional mosquitoes is statistically significant at the P05 level. And I'm willing to bet that only a few people in this audience have any idea how that argument really works. Even if you are familiar with the statistical recipe that I just ran you through, this thing is the really deep idea at the heart of that argument. If the skeptic refuses to believe your assertion that this is the correct formula, your entire argument falls to the ground in ashes. In the general recipe for statistical inference, this thing is called the sampling distribution of the test statistic under the null hypothesis. And the reason that STATS 101 was so incredibly painful is that the idea of a sampling distribution is really hard to understand, even in the best conditions. And when it's presented in pure mathematical formalism like this as a mathematical object all slathered up in degrees of freedom mumbo jumbo, it's just hopeless. Um, There might be a handful of people in this audience that could sit down and just derive this equation from first principles right now. Uh, I am certainly not among those people and I am a working data scientist. So that was STATS 101, the the analytical method. Uh, What about this computational method that I promised? Uh, Well, remember, the thing that we're trying to figure out is whether this 4.4 is a large or a small difference. So we'll just mark that 4.4 on a plot. Uh, Here's our original data color-coded to whether the subject drank beer or water. And now, if the skeptic is right, um, these, these labels have absolutely no meaning. They're completely meaningless. We can just, they carry no information. And so what I can do is randomly shuffle them around and then rearrange them and then tidy them up and then compute some new means, subtract the means and get a new difference of 3.3 mosquitoes. Uh, and we'll add a little dot to our plot at 3.3, and now we can start that whole dance over again. Uh, We'll start with the original data, we randomly shuffle, we rearrange, we tidy up, uh, compute some means, subtract the means, get a difference of 0.1 this time. Uh, And now we'll add that 0.1 to our plot. And we can keep on repeating this process over and over and over again. Here's three repetitions, here's four, here's five, here's six, and look, Ma, no hands. Right? What is happening here is we are building up um, uh, 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 the, statist- or the sampling distribution under the skeptic's argument. You are watching a statistical process unfold. Here is 20 repetitions, here's 30, here's 50, here's 50,000 repetitions. So recall the skeptic's argument that there is no difference, uh, uh, or that, that, that there is no difference, that there is no effect, uh, and that the labels were meaningless. So this data was generated under that assumption, and it shows the range of possibilities if the skeptic is right. And if the skeptic is right, a difference of 4.4 is fantastically rare. It happened just 14 times in 50,000 trials. And so it is, as the advocate said, the skeptic's argument strains credibility and can be safely rejected. And that, of course, was the conclusion of the researchers that gathered this data in the first place. 
To do the statistics that we just did, you needed three essential things. The ability to follow a straightforward, logical argument, random number generation, and iteration. You were born with the first of these three things, and the second two are provided by any decent programming language with a good library. Um, with these three things, you have everything you need to understand this argument at a very deep, fundamental level. And that is in contrast with this, the details of which you really need years of study, I think, to come to grips with. Now, that simple computational method I just showed you is called a, a random permutation test. Uh, and it's just one of a whole class of methods known as resampling methods. The other resampling method that I'd tell you about if I had more time is bootstrapping, which is fantastically useful, but I don't have more time, and so I'll just restate my thesis in a slightly different way. The message that I want to leave you with is this. If you can program a computer, you have superpowers when it comes to learning statistics. Because being able to program allows you to tinker with the most fundamental ideas in statistics, the way that you might have tinkered with electronics when you were a kid, or with mechanical things, or with music, or with sports. And so I want you to go out and to attack statistical problems with a feeling of joy in the spirit of play and not from a position of fear and self-doubt. That's all I have. Thanks for your time.